Hello, my name is Jason and welcome to DesignCast. It's a podcast where I interview a wide range of guests and ask the question, how do you design education? Why is this important? Students all learn differently and need varied teaching methods to be successful. It is more important now than ever to accommodate and personalize education for all students as much as possible. I use my 25 years of experience as an educator to ask questions and to learn about the exciting things people are doing to provide for all students and their unique perspectives. Each episode, I chat with guests from all over the world, from classroom teachers, authors, consultants, and beyond. We chat around a range of topics that we feel are important right now. Will you join me in this journey to learn and grow together? If it's your first time here, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to check it out. If you like this podcast, please leave a review, rate, subscribe, share, and download from your preferred podcasting app. This helps the podcast get discovered by new listeners. Also, please use the hashtag DesignCast when discussing your thoughts and feedback on your favorite social media platform. To connect with me, I would love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. So let's get on with the episode. On this episode of DesignCast, I had the terrific honor of speaking to Ryan Ford. Ryan is a 25-year veteran of digital design. He has been fortunate enough to lead design at some of the Internet's most interesting destinations such as DeviantArt, Crunchyroll, Chime, Vita Help, and now Crackle and Red Blocks, where he is working to revitalize these brands, which we'll talk about in the episode. His background in the industry motivated him to share some thinking around the topics like leadership, career paths, and most notably of late, the design process itself. Ryan's Design Odyssey framework topic has been read over 80,000 times as of December 2022 and has led to big reactions. Global outreach from educators who want to teach it in their classes, book opportunities, and even a TEDx salon conversation that occurred in early January 2023. We had a wonderful discussion and I'm sure that you will find some value in many of the topics that we cover. Now, let's set fire to the design process and use DesignCast as a catalyst. Enjoy. Welcome back to another episode of DesignCast, and I am just absolutely humbled and excited to have Ryan Ford with me here. Ryan, how are you, man? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me on this, Jason. Uh, Ryan, it, it is, it's totally my pleasure, and I really appreciate you accepting the invite to connect and then also to be part of, of DesignCast. And so, Ryan, if you don't mind, could you talk a little bit about what you're, what you're doing in, in your role as a designer and kind of what led you up to your place now? Absolutely. So I guess I could start way back when... I was actually brand new to the field of design. And I think, you know, for your audience, it's always valuable to hear about the journey, not just the very latest stop, you know, on the track. And the journey for me began when I was very young and I was very motivated by digital art. Being privy to the development and growth of not only the internet, of course, which sounds very strange to talk about nowadays because everyone's like, oh, the internet's always been here, but it hasn't always been here for everybody. Right. The internet brought with it the availability of a lot of digital design tools to the masses, such as Photoshop, which we all take for granted, of course, nowadays, and tools like Bryce 3D and, and things that were very, I guess, nascent for the time, but predated many of the, the modern era of digital creativity tools. And so I was very interested in the artistic opportunities that digital tools gave me. I was also a very scientific-minded, psychology-minded type of guy. I really liked the science behind 
creativity. And I really also liked programming. I liked code. And so there was sort of this creative side of me and this very engineering structured side of me that kind of found a, a home, found a place where I felt like I belonged and could contribute in the world of design. And at the time, like I said, the internet was new. I, I came upon creative communities, uh, which were also brand new at the time. And that's how I sort of found myself becoming more and more design oriented because I started to think a lot about the design of websites, the design of applications. And this was at a time where you could create skins for things like Winamp, um, which everybody <laughs> should look up. Yeah, I remember, man. I had a, yeah. I had a few skins. I remember. <laughs> Absolutely, and like ninety nine percent of them were unusable. They were so right. overly created, yeah. right? And I, I began to find this niche of sorts in creating very usable skins for software applications. And I kind of found my way to, you know, as I went through college for design, found my way to working for DeviantArt, which um, was the earliest creative art community online mm -hmm. and first i was a contractor there and i was managing freelancers to just sort of help support the community because it was very teeny tiny but then after graduation i went to design agencies and found that the agency life wasn't necessarily for me um i wanted more ownership of the output right. the products the experiences that we were creating in deviantart was uh, a great home for me. I went in as creative director, started building teams, and really learned how to manage other designers in the process. And from there, I wound up going to a number of small startups, wound up moving to the Bay Area, uh, worked for Crunchyroll, world's biggest uh, anime streaming service, um, which was an incredible experience. A lot of wonderful people that I still am friends with today. Also worked for Chime as their first head of design. Chime being America's largest uh, fintech, mobile bank, so to speak. And I sort of found my way into a niche where now I wasn't so much designing as I was building teams, building processes, building ways of thinking about design for other people, for the benefit of projects, businesses, etc. And that's how I found my place today, or I found my way to my place today as VP of Design for Crackle and Redbox, which... I, I have the lofty goal of trying to revitalize two services which have kind of gone awry in ways. Many other services have sort of taken their throne and my goal is to figure out through design how to bring them back to a higher degree of relevancy and utility. Man, I could just listen to you talk about all this stuff all day Good, long. I'll just keep talking all day this long. Is, yeah, totally. And when you were talking, I remember I was in college when we used Aldis before it was Adobe. I don't know if you remember Aldis or not, but uh, I do. It was yeah, that was, and it took eight minutes to download a photo and <laughs> two hours to print it. <laughs> Those absolutely the good old days, right? Good old days. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't call them good, but they were the old days. <laughs> They were the old days for certain. That's totally true. <laughs> That's awesome. So at the moment you're you're working with, uh, you said Crackle and Redbox, and I know you said you're revi trying to maybe help revitalize the brand and and that kind of thing. What what is that like? What you know? How does that co conversations like that happen? It can be challenging at times because there are there are a lot of people in the company who recognize the need to grow and, and shift the company's mindset, not just as it pertains to design, but as it pertains to the overall customer experience and how consumers engage with these brands. But that said, it is still a process. Change through design, transformational design, if you will, is not an overnight type of thing. It doesn't okay. just happen because I came in and said, hey, we need to do X, Y, Z. Rather, you have to very slowly but surely get people on board. You have to explain the goals over and over again, mind you. Um, there's a lot of repetition in my <laughs> role. And I'm not saying that as a bad thing. No. It's actually <laughs> something that I think a lot of designers out there need to understand is that change is a slow, repetitive process. You have to repeat your goals. You have to repeat your methodologies. You have to talk about what actually equates to quality, um, mm. what equates to good design these days. It's not as objective and universal mm. as we within the industry might think. Right. And you have to explain a lot of these things to non-designers who mm. are your stakeholders, your teammates, even your boss. And so the process has been one where people are philosophically on board. 
which is great. We have done a lot of incredible work to rebuild applications, software experiences, and products for Crackle, which have had a very, very positive reception. We've seen all the meaningful stats get a very large uplift. I mean, we just very recently relaunched mm -hmm. Crackle.com and saw an almost overnight 500% increase in user signups. Wow. It's a free wow. service, mind you. Right, right. 500% more people are suddenly seeing value in the service. They're seeing very clear guidance to sign up for a free account, so on and so forth. So design can be very, very powerful without necessarily transforming the fundamental utility of the service, which is free streaming. Like, right. it's still free streaming. We just changed the way people experienced it. That's awesome. So Crackle has a, a special place in my heart because living overseas, it was one of the only places I could stream stuff on the internet for many years. And so mm -hmm. I, appreci I appreciate that. So tell everyone thank you for me about that. <laughs> I will. I will absolutely yeah, let everybody it was, know. It was, yeah, let everyone know. You, you've already kind of talked about some of the things that can be a challenge about explaining things to non-designers and even uh -huh. younger designers sometimes don't completely understand the process and how those things come about. What have been some of the things you're really proud of in your career that you've been able to accomplish? I guess looking outside of what I'm doing now, there's of course the work at DeviantArt, which I mentioned, and I, I have a lot of pride for that work, even though over the years it has transformed, it has changed. A lot of my original stuff is no longer necessarily there, but we were defining paradigms, uh, ways of thinking and working, and interface design patterns that right. really weren't being done elsewhere. You have to keep in mind that DeviantArt actually predates Facebook. It predates Twitter. It predates a lot of the social media uh, and community-oriented services that people use today, and which, again, we take for granted. But things as simple as like badges, badges next to your username, uh, the idea of a username, the idea of an avatar, decorations to the avatar. We, I don't want to say we invented because that's not necessarily true, but we really established ways of right. doing design, right. digital design that were adopted pretty quickly by a lot of the larger companies. So experiences like Facebook, whatever you might think about Facebook, a lot of <laughs> what they wound up doing was stuff that we kind of pioneered in a way. Yeah, so I have a lot yeah. of pride in that. And yeah. I also have a lot of pride, not necessarily in the in the work I did, quote unquote, in the designs that I pushed out, but in the people that I mentored and led who have gone on to bigger and better things and have mm. they themselves grown into design leaders. People who are very empathetic, you know, motivated, have a very good sense of what quality design looks like. And through their work, they've been able to accomplish a lot of things. And I think that's more of the legacy that we leave behind as design leaders is the people that we teach and mentor along the way. Even if you're not thinking about it from that lens, um, you do touch people uh, emotionally and professionally. The way in which you behave and lead teaches them how to go about behaving and leading. Or okay. if you do a bad job, it teaches them how not to be, <laughs> right? Which is also valuable in a way. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that because that's totally true. Is We've all had people who have set bad examples or told us wrong stuff. And so, yeah, it's important to be able to keep that in mind so that's awesome thank you ryan and i just i'm so inspired just listening to you and it just makes me think of all my design students and where they where they might end up and so i'm really encouraged by that so we connected because i read an article that you had written on medium about the design odyssey framework and so that's yes. what i really want to talk to you about and so i understand design is messy and i'm really interested to hear about how using that messiness helped <laughs> you develop this idea of a new framework or a different framework for how design works. Absolutely. Happy to talk about that. I know that's the impetus behind the conversation after all. <laughs> Be before I talk about the messiness of design, yeah. though, I think we need to all understand that there's an awareness of how design works within the design industry and then a belief yeah. about how design ought to work outside the design industry. I think that is the foundational impetus behind me creating a quote-unquote new framework. And I hesitate to really call it that, and I'll explain why in a moment. Okay. But okay. <laughs> outside of design, there is a fundamental belief that design ought to be a highly structured, highly rigid, step-by-step -step type of linear process. 
And that is, I believe, motivated by the way other teams, organizations, and industries operate, which is very linear, which is very step-by-step. You do X, then you do Y, then you do Z in that order to get to your intended output. And there's a lot of very production, you know, lever pulling oriented thinking behind that. And I'm not saying that that's bad for them to work that way, but it's more, you know, a mismatch in terms of the way that they work and the way that we work in design. Design being a convergence of creative artistry and scientific philosophical thinking and communication kind of all wrapped into one big messy ball. It means that we can't necessarily always follow this rigid structure that others expect us to follow. And that has, in my career, resulted in a lot of conflict, which I've I've had to learn how to resolve over time. Initially, that conflict gave me the sense that maybe I was doing something wrong. Maybe I was a, a bad designer because I wasn't following a very rigid process, or maybe I was a bad leader because I wasn't following a rigid process. Mm. Eventually, I realized it's not really me because so many other great designers that I know and admire don't have a rigid process. And some of the best design work that I've used, that I've been privy to, that I've seen, has also not been the result of a rigid process. Yeah. And so I... I came to realize that that there's no true rigid process to follow. Now, these other teams, or rather I should say these other organizations and stakeholders and partners in business, they have become more and more aware over the years of two manners of thinking. One being design thinking, quote unquote, which is a bad bad name, but we kind of all (laughs) understand what that means nowadays. Yes. (laughs) And the double diamond structure. And both of those are highly abstract at least in their intention, right? They're very loose, they're very ontological ways of thinking where they're kind of analogies and not necessarily step-by-step guides. And the intention behind both of them is, as a designer, you're supposed to sort of take what you want from these structures. You're supposed to use them as a very loose guide and go about your way designing something wonderful, both of which are very, very rooted in human-centered design or customer centricity. And I don't mean to imply that those are bad things at all. In fact, they're wonderful things, but they're largely misinterpreted. And so because of that misinterpretation, designers get handed design thinking and they get handed double diamond and told, you need to work this way as if it's a rigid step-by-step guide, which it, it never was meant to be. They never were meant to be. And they're not in actuality. And as such, they don't perfectly align with the way designers work. So what I sought to do is kind of push back against that way of thinking by creating something which was semi-serious and semi-antagonistic, right? And a little bit fun because if anything, playfulness and fun in your design process is so important to the work that we do. It's not only important to the work that we do, but also to our mental health as creative people, but it also meaningfully informs the final output and human beings i have to say human beings appreciate work that has play injected into it more so than they appreciate like very stark basic serious things human beings i think are designed to play playfulness Mm -hmm. is baked into our dna and it's the one of the books i have it here I wanted to make sure I could refer to the title properly. Creative Confidence by Tom yep. Kelly and David Kelly. Uh, <laughs> right Tom behind Kelly, me. I got one too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so great. <laughs> so so in that book, he talks about, and I agree right. with this, he talks about how as children, like playfulness and creativity are completely natural to us. And as we age, it's sort of like beaten out of us, right? Designers, that's true for us as well. But I think the unique thing about us is that we still have this zeal this lust to create, to be playful. And if we give in to excluding playfulness from our work, the work suffers. Um, And we know, we all know. So part of my quote unquote framework was also meant to integrate reality, the reality of the value of playfulness, the reality of uh, stakeholders changing their minds halfway through your process, (laughs) Um, the reality of how user testing can completely destroy what you thought was true along the way. So it was a way to say double diamond and design thinking in their application are mostly baloney, mostly garbage. (laughs) And 
let's deal with practical reality. Let's let's talk about the way it really is. And if you have to, you can print out this big graphic I made and put it on a wall. And tell the non-designers that this is your framework. I love the graphic. I am. I I know that folks are going to want to get a copy of that, so I'm going to have to ask you to to share a copy with me so I can have Absolutely. it ready for them. Or they can contact you. I don't know if you want to get a thousand people asking you these questions, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. And and when I when I meet, I thank you for sharing that journey with me because I immediately saw it and was immediately I had a response. Right, I immediately felt connected to many, many, many of the things that I saw there. And I'm I'm thinking about it from a design education standpoint of working with you know kids and students of, on how to be a better designer, how to work through the design process. And when I immediately saw it, I was like, oh my gosh, I've experienced this a thousand times. So I think that I love, I love the name. I know that in your, your Medium article, you said it's not a great name. I love the name. I think the Odyssey is a great name for it because it's continuing to happen. And so, wow, that's, that's amazing. So what's your response been like? I mean, I had a response to it. What's the response been like that you, when you kind of put this out there into the world? The response has been really incredible. I have to say it really surprised me. I, yes, meant to antagonize the entire design community. However, I didn't expect there to be, a, to date, there are over 80,000 viewers of the article. Wow. Thousands of people have on Medium, you know, you clap for yeah. it. Thousands of claps. Sure. 40 to 50 responses to it, just feedback. And the direct feedback has ranged from, you know, wow, this is this is great. I love it. It it really mirrors what I've experienced in design to people right. who are telling me I don't understand anything about design. And you know what? Like it that's all valid, right? Because right. the lived experience of other people is going to differ from my own. And mm -hmm. I appreciate that. And in fact, I've tried to respond to a lot of people who have brought up valid arguments, you know, counter counterpoints to what I have uh, suggested or implied through my article. And again, I appreciate all of it. And also, I've been asked to participate in a TEDx talk in January. I believe it's on January 11th, which is really about this topic, about the topic of setting fire to the design process, or at least the idea of design process. And I'm really looking forward to that as well. The response, though, like I said, has been surprising. And on Twitter, it's also been shared a lot with very similar feedback. I've seen it shared by design leaders at really? a lot of large companies who have wow. both said, this is an incredible article, let's talk about it, to this guy's an idiot. I've received responses from design educators all over the world who right. have said, I'm teaching this to my college level class. Could you send me a diagram of it? I've also actually seen recruiters who don't know that I have written it, sharing it with their own audiences on LinkedIn and elsewhere, saying, I think wow. you really need to read this. And I've you know, had the sort of fun opportunity that that presented to reach out and say, hey, actually, I wrote that. And they're <laughs> like, oh, wow. <laughs> that's amazing, man. That is, that's great. And it had, I guess what you wanted to happen happened, which was to create a conversation right around yes. this idea that this construct this really rigid framework is not all there is it's like you said it was i think designed originally just to create a place for these things to start to occur and i think that we've outgrown that at this point <laughs> and i love yes. your deviant art angst to add to that so i think that's <laughs> <laughs> that's really amazing Thank you so much, Ryan. I know that people are going to be super stoked to, to to see more about that. And so just shifting gears a little bit, where do you see the the field of design, especially in the, the field you work in, going in the next five to 10 years? What do you think is going to happen? It's moving so quickly. What, what's next? Things are changing by the day, it seems like. And something that's really relevant right now, not just in design, but in creativity in general, is AI. AI is kind of having a hot moment. For better or for worse, AI <laughs> is here and it's changing the way in which we go about doing our work. For visual artists, for example, they're seeing AI effectively lift their artistic styles, applying those, those styles to new pieces of work that are derivative, but new. And now we have copywriting bots who are maybe I shouldn't say who, but which are writing original copy stories, copywriting for landing oh, yeah. pages, 
even right, just today, literally today, I saw one of my connections share a Figma plugin he was developing that used the GPT-3 AI architecture to automatically mm. fill in copy based on just a few you know, suggested topics wow. or points. Now, it, it's a little bit scary because there's a lot of work, there's a lot of output that these AI bots can do, which is pretty good. Like, it's believable, it's generally speaking relevant to what you ask for, but it's also not as good, you know, 99% of the time, it's not as good as what a human being with strategy, with years of experience under their belt would be able to create would be able to write. I think there is going to continue to be interest and exploration in these AI bots, not just as replacements for creative people, but also as aids, as tools that we can use to do our work more effectively and faster. Right. I don't think AI will ever get to the point where it can be as creative as a human being, mm -hmm. because AI right. is, by its very nature, copying what's already been done. And I, we can have a whole argument about what it means to be <laughs> You know, yes. a creative human being versus a, a creative bot. Sure. But I guess I'll sort of summarize by saying AI is here to stay. It's going to keep getting smarter, but we're, as an industry, going to have to be very careful with how we ourselves use it in our work. I don't think it can be a perfect replacement for like a great copywriter on your team or a great visual designer or illustrator on your team, but it can help you realize ideas a little bit faster before you get to the point of engaging with one of those types of people. I've seen it just absolutely explode over the last month or two. I mean, like it's it's actually kind of mind blowing to see how I know it was there, but to see the advancement of it over the past year or a couple of years has been absolutely stunning to see how fast and fascinating it becomes so mainstream. Uh, it's pretty crazy. So Awesome. Ryan, thank you so much. So one or two last questions. One is, what are you really excited about at the moment, either in your work or just in your overall just sort of life on this earth? <laughs> I, I guess I would say I'm really excited about rediscovering community. And what I mean by that is, you know, that right now it's it's several years post the official onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the pandemic changed the way a lot of us, most of us, find community. It used to be some combination of digital experiences and, and yeah. human in-person experiences. And COVID really shifted us almost entirely to digital experiences. And, you know, I'm no different, right? I've, I've felt this shift. And on one hand, hey, it's great. You know, you reduce your risk of exposure to COVID and other things like the cold and the flu and all, you know, all the possible contagions you can pick up. And that's great for for most people, to be quite honest with you. However, I really miss the sense of community that existed prior to the onset of the pandemic. The design meetups, the interesting conversations that I would have with people at those types of events. And I'm starting to see some of it slowly come back. Now, I'm not saying I'm longing for the convention circuit, where people right. are traveling cross country to go to right. design conventions, but more like the local stuff, you know, mm -hmm. San okay. Francisco Bay Area stuff in my case. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to re-experiencing human connection again. And I think that type of thinking would be good for mm -hmm. a lot of us. Totally, man. I 100% agree. I think that's one thing we will really miss out on is that whole idea of community and education's not immune to that. You know, it's the same way too, so... Ryan, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. I've really enjoyed this. I want to ask you one question, and that is, if you could travel back in time, what is one thing you would say to yourself? Okay, so that's a hard question. <laughs> but I think if I could travel back in, back in time and talk to myself as you know a younger me, I would say that it's really worth the journey. And a lot of things will change, a lot of things will be challenging, but to keep on with it, because the impact you can have, especially in design, is so significant. It used to be that people would talk about design changing the world. Now, I don't necessarily believe that design by itself changes the world, you know? I think design helps realize a lot of very difficult ideas and makes them consumable, understandable for regular people. I think design helps, but I don't think design by itself changes the world. But the world's worth changing. 
and design can help. So I guess in short, I would say don't give up, keep going. It's worth it. That's great advice, man. That's a great place for us to kind of wrap things up. And Ryan, listen, I really appreciate you taking the time and, and making this happen. It's just been such a, an honor for me to sit with you and chat with you about these things. And I will make sure to include social media connections and whatnot in the show notes so that people can reach out and get in touch with you if they're interested in having a further discussion or who knows what. Right. So I really appreciate that. And uh, I wish you the best of luck in your TEDx talk and with all the things that you're all the projects you're working on, man, they're really exciting. And I can't wait to see how they how they turn out. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me here, Jason. And it was a great uh, opportunity and a joy to be on this. Thank you for being a loyal DesignCast listener. Without your support, this would not be possible. As a loyal part of my professional network, I want to share with you an exciting event that will be happening in January and February of 2023. I'd like to invite you to an upcoming series of professional development workshops or PD Collective, organized by Classipy, a New Zealand-based global education organization. The Classipy PD Collective is a free, high-quality, online professional development workshop series that aims to bring together worldwide experts and leaders in education, all on one platform. The focus is on uniting teachers across the globe so as to ease the process of international collaboration and make an impact on international education. I'm humbled to share with you that I am one of the key facilitators at this event. I'm presenting a session on the topic, Universal Design for Learning, and we're going to be doing a deep dive. And that's going to happen on February 4th, 2023 at 10 a.m. India Standard Time. Along with me, there are other prestigious keynote speakers and facilitators who will guide you through the progressive learning workshop model with productive sessions followed by tasks that will allow you to explore the Classic platform in more detail. Please mark your calendar and save the date by registering for this event by visiting the link in the show notes. I'm looking forward to this two months of learning with Classic where we learn, grow, and collaborate with educators across the globe. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. Explore more podcasts at www.teachbetterpodcastnetwork.com. We will see you on the next episode. I hope that you enjoyed that episode of DesignCast. Again, I'm Jason. I am the creator and host and one-man band when it comes to this podcast. I sincerely hope you enjoyed it. And please share it with your colleagues and friends and help me network with those folks who you think will benefit from listening to this podcast. If you own a company or you have connections where you would like to partner with me in this podcast, whether it be sponsorship or product reviews or any other possible services, please reach out to me. My contact information is in the show notes and I cannot wait to hear from you. I only do this because I love talking to people and I love sharing my passion with all the listeners. So if you are interested in possibly being a future guest, please reach out and get in touch. I can't wait to hear from you. I really want to hear about how this podcast and its guests are helping you become better or to enrich your lives. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, be good to one another.